just sort of closed down for years. Not till I was 16 or 17 started listening to music, reading poetry, thinking about go all those things. I seemed to wake up again. You were the first student, as I said, to do Malcolm Bradbury's MA in creative writing at University East Anglia. So you'd already decided you wanted to be a writer. Going to UEA for a year was a fantastic stroke of luck for me. I was the only student. The course, the creative writing course, consisted of seeing Malcolm Bradbury or trying to see him. In the term that he was meant to be teaching me, I saw him maybe three occasions for maybe 20 minutes. It was usually in the pub, The Maid's Head. I'd give him a story and he said... I like it a lot. Uh, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I think you're writing a story about uh, a boy who uh, rapes his sister. And he would say, oh, fine, uh, when can I have it? And, uh, and that would be it. I mean, uh, there was no course. But he was the superstar professor. He was my readership. And it meant that I wrote with a purpose. I must have written, I don't know, 25 or 30 stories that year. Ian McEwan has a very high reputation in what are called literary circles. He's published one collection of short stories, and this is his new collection, In Between the Sheets. He deals with subjects many people find distasteful and even disgusting. I'm taking for granted that the unconscious exists and that things go on in our minds which we are not aware of in our day-to-day -day reflections upon our conscious minds. Jack! They also earned you a reputation for being shocking, amoral. They seemed to dwell in dark crevices, which had been neatly stepped over by previous generations of novelists. <sighs> Were you aiming to do that? I used to deny this, but I, I think... Uh... I did want something very bold and bright. I, I did feel rather oppressed reading um, contemporary writing in the sort of late 60s, early 70s in Britain. Uh, I thought in a, in a tiny way I, what I wanted was very bold colours. And I think I really did actually end up writing myself into a corner. I mean, but looking at those stories where we're talking about senses of violence, different sorts of violence, violence against... Uh, the morals of the time, violence against the person, violence against yourself. Even from the little you've talked about your childhood, was the sense of violence around you? In an army camp, is, there is violence in the air. These people are trained mm -hmm. to go to war. I mean, experience has got to come from somewhere. Yeah. You see it coming out of that. Well, there, there, there was all, everything that you described there, plus uh, a fantastic degree of repression. Um, a, a very polite middle-class lower middle class world in which however terrible things were no one ever said I'm unhappy normal life must always go on was the sort of uh, key to it all so it was pretty held down, locked in and I think that when I was writing in my uh, late teens, early twenties I felt a fantastic liberation I can say what I want at last yes and it's rather like a shy person who uh, has you know three glasses of wine at dinner and decides he wants to be bold like everyone else and goes too far. I blurted out these stories. No, it's definitely this way. I'm sorry, but it is. The Comfort of Strangers, that's the story of a young couple on holiday in Venice who are at first taken up by, then stalked by, then fall into the hands of this, way? this very mysterious and destructive figure. Where did that come from? I think we're on the right track. So do I. Good evening. You need help? Oh, God. Um, it was... Uh, I think it came out of a sort of depression, to be quite honest. Uh, it, it was... It's certainly the darkest thing I ever wrote. Mm. Uh, I thought that I was coming to the end of what I could do in fiction. Um, I thought that by the time I finish this short novel, I, either I won't ever write again or I have to do something entirely different. To Colin and Mary. Like most writers, I can't really say exactly where it came from. Dinner. Oh, I better get dressed. 
I'd spent a, a rather awkward week with a close friend in Venice. I'd, I suppose, was very aware of Venice being a sort of place trampled on, almost to the point where it was not a city at all, by uh, literary imaginations, whether it was Dickens or Mary McCarthy or Henry James. I mean, it, everyone had been through it. The stones were worn smooth by description, that it was an unreal place. Uh, and that seemed a sort of very good setting for this couple who were, were so lost. These books are the favorite literature of my father, my grandfather. They were men, and they were proud of their sex. Women understood them too. Now, uh, women treat men like children because they can't take them seriously. So. This is a museum dedicated to the good old days. Hmm? <laughs> And I was never fully satisfied with this novel. I always felt, for example, when Paul Schrader, Harold Pinter made the movie, uh, that I hadn't given them enough. There was not enough in this novel to sustain a movie. But it, to answer your question, I just felt I was at the end of something. I just couldn't see there was any future for me. I was, gonna, I was writing myself into silence, I thought, with this fantastically destructive, bleak, uh, murderous story of, of um, one couple's sort of psychosexual dramas um, spilling out and destroying uh, this vulnerable English couple who seemed incapable of actually ever uh, defending themselves or defining themselves or understanding themselves in any way at all. We're shortlisted for the Booker Prize. Yeah. Yeah. And your reputation was very high, and uh, people like you know, myself and our lot around New Review and all that, you, it was very high. And you, you really did think you'd written yourself out in fiction. Yeah. I... How did you feel about thinking that? And then what did you do about feeling about thinking that? I thought there was a fantastic disjunction between all the things I thought about and talked about with friends and the things I wrote about. I felt as if I was only writing out of the sort of tiny corner of my mind. Um, and I, uh, two things happened. One, one was that uh, I was very caught up in the anti-nuclear, anti-arms race um, movement of the early 80s. What is nice about this is that you've got an open vowel. And I worked with Michael Barclay on an oratorio. Which means that we can do it. Shall we die? So for once, I was writing about something sort of outside myself. So you go from... Yes, that's right. And the second thing I did was write a screenplay for uh, The Plowman's Lunch for Richard Eyre. Both projects meant sort of getting away from myself, or getting away from the solitude of writing. <laughs> That's enough of that. We've been playing for ten minutes, for Christ's sake. That's far too long. Oh. Oh. Plowman's lunch is quite interesting in reference to Saturday because you're talking about a, a specific political moment post Falklands at the Tory party conference. Yeah. Thatcher is there. Very bold to shoot it there. Very, uh, um, uh, dared. Wow. Oh, look, there goes my jeep straight. Excuse me. We all got accreditation from ITN, including our actors, Jonathan Price. General Sir James Penfield. So we just mingled with the crowd and no one noticed that we were lumping around um, 35 millimeter cameras. We now face a professional left financed at the ratepayer and taxpayer's expense. That was very odd because I hadn't actually thought of this parallel till you mentioned it. When I started the Plumber's Lunch, it was simply about a historian writing an account of the Suez Crisis. The spirit of the South Atlantic was the spirit of Britain at her best. Between the first.